Oh, the food pyramid, quite possibly the go-to example of why you can't trust everything you hear when it comes to nutrition. It has been the butt of the joke for literally decades because of how seemingly backwards it is in its presentation and recommendations for how to have a healthy diet. Now, there are a few theories as to why the food pyramid is structured the way that it is. Many people believe that the food industry's research is flawed, and I feel like to a certain point that is not negotiable with overlapping and contradictory studies that often feel cherry-picked to push a certain way of eating. And many go a step further and believe that there is corruption in the food industry, with businesses and organizations slipping money under the table to push certain products being called healthy. And on the flip side, there being products that have been unfairly deemed unhealthy through similar means. This being said, I'm not really here to talk about all that, it just doesn't really interest me. No, I want to talk about the results, the recommendations, and the pyramid itself. The food pyramid was originally intended to be a visual representation of how many servings of each type of food was recommended to be eaten per day for a healthy, balanced diet. It wasn't the first major attempt at this, but it is the most well-known. And over the years, it's gone through some pretty dramatic changes as well. So before I feel like we can adequately judge it, we should first go through the history of the food pyramid and then discuss what went wrong. The very first food pyramid was released in Sweden in 1974. It was created by Anna Britt Agensater, who at the time worked for a Swedish grocery cooperative. It was a response to the 1943 USDA's Basic 7 Food Guide, which was designed to help people ration food during World War II. Make sure to note that nutrition was not at the top of their criteria. Agensater's main goal seemed to be to divide food in a way that would represent how much a person should eat of each of them, telling people to eat more of the foods from the bottom of the pyramid pyramid, the widest section, and not as much of the foods in the top, the narrowest section. Her food pyramid was divided into three levels, the bottom tier being grains, legumes, potatoes, and milk, the middle tier being fruits and vegetables, and the top tier being meat, fish, and eggs. Over the years, there were a few other government dietary guidelines like the hassle-free daily food guide and the food wheel, but in 1992, the USDA decided they wanted in on the pyramid action. It was the first food guide to use consumer research and was designed with the intention of illustrating three key concepts, variety, moderation, and proportion. This food pyramid was divided into four levels with recommended servings per day and is as follows. The bottom tier, grains, with a recommended 6 to 11 servings a day. The second tier, fruits and vegetables, with 2 to 5 servings of each a day. The third tier, protein and dairy, with 2 to 3 servings of each a day. Protein here including meat, poultry, fish, eggs, nuts, and beans. And the top tier being sweets, fats, and oils, which were recommended to be eaten sparingly. Not long after, several other countries adopted this model. In 2005, the USDA introduced a new dietary model called My Pyramid, where the pyramid was this time divided vertically with varying widths of stripes representing proportions to try to rid of confusion of importance. Apparently before, many people thought the pyramid was a priority scale and not a portion one. Thus, people prioritized grains and fruits and vegetables, often opting out of protein-rich foods altogether. The stripes this time were different colors to be more visually appealing, and illustrated a person climbing up the pyramid to subconsciously encourage physical activity. Then in 2011, the pyramid was thrown out altogether in favor of my plate, using a plate as the visual marker. Revealed by then First Lady Michelle Obama and Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, it divides the plate up between fruits, vegetables, grains, and protein with a small circle on the side for dairy. Now, credit where credit is due, this does in my opinion do a better job of portraying portions as it represents an actual meal, something they apparently struggled with for about 20 years. They also rid of sugars and fats and oils, believing they don't have a necessary place in a healthy diet. There were also a few other more advice-like specific guidelines, including to make half your grains whole grains, to vary your vegetables and protein, and to choose lower fat dairy and protein options. My plate is still used to this day, but it's updated every five years to reflect current health research. That can be a good or bad thing depending on how much you trust current health research. Now it should be mentioned that obesity, heart disease, and type 2 diabetes rates here in the states have skyrocketed since the early 90s when the original USDA food pyramid was released. Obesity is defined by having a 30% body fat or higher. In 1990, the obesity rate was 12%. In 2005, when my pyramid was released, it was around 23%. And today in 2024, it hovers at around 40%. Additionally, 31% of the population is considered overweight, which is a 25 to 30 
20% body fat content. Guys, that's over two-thirds of the population total that is considered overweight or obese. Now, granted, that's based on BMI, which honestly deserves a what went wrong video of its own, but it does do a much better job of representing populations than it does individuals. Childhood obesity rates have also followed a similar trend, and it should be mentioned that a lot of them have to follow the MyPlate model for the food they're given at school. I think it's safe to say that diet and overall health of people has declined dramatically, and it should be pretty evident by this point in the video that the food pyramid and its evolutions are not helping. But before we really dig into what went wrong, let's take a minute to appreciate the things that they got right. Don't worry, this will be quick. Even a broken clock is right twice a day, and as backwards thinking as the food pyramid and its successors seem to be, there are a few notable, genuinely good guidelines that I want to highlight. So this is, surprisingly, what went right. The first of these being the low added sugar and extra fat and oil recommendation. In general, sugary foods are somewhere between unnecessary and detrimental for health, so recommending them less, and then eventually not at all, is a good call. The same is true for the majority of fats and oils. Most of the beneficial fatty acids you want will be coming from other foods, and most of the fatty acids that are in common cooking fats and oils are less essential and most people are consuming more than enough of them anyway. Thus, limiting and then removing the recommendation is again perfectly fine. Number two is the promotion of whole grains. Despite not always making it to the visual, more recent updates have pushed more for specifically whole grains. This is progress because whole grains are generally more nutrient-dense than their processed counterparts. If you're going to be eating carb-dense foods, you might as well be getting something extra with them. Third is the major inclusion of fruits and vegetables. While they weren't quite considered the foundational food groups, they were second only behind grains. And if you're going to eat extra of anything, fruits and veggies are probably what it should be. They're usually low calorie, somewhat micro dense, and you can get versions of them that are generally not ruined by human involvement. If you feel the need to eat more than you planned, these are the least likely to detriment you and any goals that you might have. The next is the my plate layout. I have have seen several of the leading fitness and nutrition educators recommend dividing their plate in a similar fashion at mealtime. It's a much easier way to view everything you're eating compared to having it in more of a pile with, say, your carbs at the bottom and everything layered on top. For athletes and people who need to be more specific about their macronutrient ratios, this is a simple yet effective way to do that. And the last thing I want to mention here is the promotion of exercise. I really appreciate how the second version, My Pyramid, went out of its way to visually encourage physical physical activity. I mean, they got rid of it six years later, but they tried. Realistically, they probably did a few other things right, but in case you can't tell, I'm kind of reaching here with some of these positives. Plus, this is a video about what went wrong after all, right? And finally, as we've been building up to the whole time, the problems. The first problem I notice is the lack of clarity when it comes to nutrients. Not all foods are just one type of macronutrient, in fact, most are not. Grains, fruits, vegetables, meats, they're not all created equal, they have varying macro and micronutritional profiles, something that should be very apparent if you've watched my nutrition tier list series. Many grains are not all carbs, they have notable amounts of the other macronutrients. And almost everything in their protein group contains fat, with many containing as much, if not more, fat than protein. This complexity is not shown in any food pyramid variation without some serious additional research. In a similar vein, there's some inconsistencies with the serving recommendations themselves. Trying to set a rigid ratio of the amount of servings of different food groups that everyone should follow is just a bad call. Different bodies with different goals need macronutrients in different ratios. Additionally, there's varying serving sizes within the food groups themselves. For example, with their protein food group, most meat serving sizes are 85 to 100 grams, while the serving sizes of most nuts are about 30 grams. These are not calorically comparable, and there is a ridiculous ridiculous amount of room for error. And then we get to the nutrients themselves, and this is where it starts really getting bad. The first I want to talk about is their low protein recommendations. They seem to actively recommend against adequate intake of what I have called time and time again the most important nutrient. And if you want to know why I think that, I've got a whole video about it right here. But remember, in all three of the main formats, protein was not just meat. It was fish, eggs, nuts, beans, and it was lumped right in there with dairy. This is pretty much every single protein protein-dense food. I'm sorry to say it, but you're just not going to get most of your protein from grains and vegetables. It just doesn't work like that. Simply put, if you're going to prioritize any macronutrient, it should be protein, especially since your body can turn protein into carbohydrates. This is such a simple and almost universally agreed upon concept, and it is borderline suspicious how adamant they are about getting it wrong. 
And moving right along, I would say the next problem is their demonizing of fat. Fat is an essential nutrient. I don't know how many times I need to say it. Now, in the previous segment, I praised them for having low fat and oil recommendations and then eventually cutting it out entirely. But there is a big difference between fats the food group and fat the nutrient. Fat the nutrient is necessary. Without it, your body does not work like it's supposed to. It's needed for cell and organ structure, brain and neural function, nutrient absorption, it's just needed. If you want more information, I have multiple videos on this. What every single food pyramid variation has failed to account for is different types of fats. Usually the extent of their advice is to get as low of fat options as possible. But as we've talked about many times before, there's a lot of different types of fats. Some are more beneficial, some are more essential, some we as a society consume a lot more of, and some are more harmful when consume past a certain point. Their intention behind ridding of a fat and oil food group was, I'm assuming, to try and decrease how much we consume of the latter two. This mainly applies to omega-6 polyunsaturated fats and saturated fats, two broader types that definitely have their roles to play in the body, but most people really do consume more of them than they need, especially the former. While it's pretty hard to accidentally eat saturated fats, omega-6s are in literally everything, especially many of their beloved grain products. The variety of omega-6 oils are virtually impossible to avoid these days. So while this may help people not use extra omega-6 vegetable oils, it also effectively says to limit your monounsaturated oils, which are almost exclusively positive. And possibly the most important problem with this whole fat topic is the lack of omega-3s. It's pretty rare to see any omega-3 source on any of these. The protein sections, which are already small, always talk about meat and poultry and maybe eggs, but very rarely seafood. There wasn't even a fish on the thumbnail, but you didn't notice, did you? And that's the problem. Omega-3 sources in everyday life are so non-existent that we don't even register it. Now, you could make the argument that there are some plant omega-3 sources that are technically represented, but let's be real, anyone who doesn't already know about them isn't going to seek out those foods. We are currently in an omega-3 epidemic, and these government nutrition guidelines are not helping. Taking a little detour from macros, I want to address the food pyramid's low recommendations of essential vitamins and minerals. This one is pretty straightforward. The majority of foods that provide ample amounts of the most commonly deficient micronutrients are not recommended to be consumed as much. I'm talking about micros like calcium, iron, magnesium, vitamin D, and vitamin B12. A lack of these can contribute to several chronic diseases and just overall the body not handling as well as it should. And now we get to the big one that everyone's probably been waiting on, the food pyramid's recommendation for an overabundance of carbohydrates. Earlier I praised them for having a low to non-existent sugar recommendation, but really that is just a drop of good in the ocean of what they're doing wrong with their carbohydrates. Pretty much all carbs, regardless of origin, eventually get turned into glucose. When that glucose is not used, it is first stored as glycogen for immediate use, and then the rest is stored as fat. The majority of calories in Grains, fruits, and vegetables are carbohydrates, and those three are the foundation of every single American food pyramid variant. There is no one on earth using that much glucose, especially not the average sedentary American. And little by little, that is probably the main factor contributing to our obesity and chronic illness rates, especially because the intention of eating these food groups doesn't even match the reality. Grains, fruits, and vegetables are probably the three most common food groups that are altered, processed, preserved, contain added sugar, and have removed nutrients. Now, don't twist what I'm trying to say here. I am not anti-carbohydrates. I eat carbs every day. I enjoy them. I am also very active and very aware of my consumption of them. I use them as fuel. That's why they exist. They're the body's go-to fuel source, especially for higher intensity activity, which is needed to be optimally healthy. Realistically, it's better to eat carbohydrates and exercise than it is to avoid them and not have the energy to exercise properly. This should not be a controversial stance, and yet somehow it is. The point is, high carbohydrate foods should not be your focus. Carbs are a tool. They should be a source of energy and even a source of enjoyment, not the foundation of your diet. Now, I could probably sit here and poke holes in these guidelines all day, but I really don't want to because realistically, they were fighting a losing battle from the start. You can't simplify nutrition down to one model. It just can't be done. The sheer amount of different diets and varying health and nutrition advice should be evidence of that. There's a lot of ways to skin this cat, and there's a variety of options to fill in the nutrition gaps that you need to have a healthy diet. That being said, there are some hard rules about nutrition that you just can't get wrong. I mean, somehow they did, but fortunately, more people 
are moving away from this one-size-fits-all approach. They're doing their own research, advocating for their own bodies, and making their own decisions. Instead of completely trusting organizations that may or may not know what they're talking about and may or may not have their best interest in mind. But overall, when it comes to the food pyramid's journey, I would say they're generally making progress, just very slowly. But let me know down in the comments what you think. Now, if you enjoyed the video, or at the very least learned a little something, I encourage you to subscribe as I plan to make more videos similar to this. Speaking of which, go ahead and let me know if you like this new format and what other topics would work well with it. And remember that all I ask is that you do your own research and advocate for your body. You only get the one.